this week, we have John Notwell. He is the Chief Executive Officer for the Utah Technology Council, an industry association supporting more than 6,000 technology-oriented companies across the state. As a 12-year veteran in the growing tech community, he has a unique understanding of the blend of sales and community it takes to support continued growth and prosperity in Utah. He has been recognized as the CXO of the year and of the 40 under 40. He also represents House District 52 in the Utah Legislature and is the Majority Assistant Whip. John and his wife, Jill, have lived in Harriman for 12 years and they are the parents of five kids. With our discussion, we'll also be having it moderated by Dean Patel. So we would like to hand the time over to you too. Thank you. Thank you, Levi. Thanks everyone. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation with a fellow Politico. So we've had some great conversation already. Um, John, thanks for making the drive up. It's a, it's yeah, a yeah, busy day. But I mean, Dave, seriously, why? Like, hey, it's pretty deep, it's pretty decent, County, right? It's, whenever we can. Yeah. It's, all right. it's fantastic to be here on campus. So um, for our students that, that may not be aware of, of trade associations, can you tell us a little bit about the Utah Technology Council and maybe your typical day? Sure. Well, the mission of uh, UTC is to build the strongest, most inclusive, and most connected innovation community in the country. Uh, we represent some 6,500 technology companies and 135,000 technology connected workers. So that uh, would include everybody that is in a company that you might know like Qualtrics and, uh, and then all of the technology oriented workers in a company like Intermountain Healthcare. So it's a, it's a pretty broad swath of companies and people and job roles. Um, and we, we really do that through three things. We have uh, programs and events geared toward workforce and talent and education. Uh, we do research and data on this uh, innovation economy in the state. And uh, we have an advocacy effort. That's one of the primary responsibilities of a trade association is to advocate on behalf of those companies at the local, at the state, and at the national level. And are you, are you members the companies or the, the employees? Our members are the companies, yeah. The companies, and, and of course, those companies, everybody in that company is, sure. is, a, is a member. But, uh, but yeah, we measure it in terms of uh, industry or companies, yeah. So um, the, the focus of, of, of this uh, forum is leadership. So let me start with a CEO. What's your typical day? Uh, crazy. Uh, crazy. I spend most of my day in meetings, uh, either you know, as a community advocate, um, as a, an evangelist for tech in Utah through our, you know, our government partners or our community partners, uh, meetings with my team uh, as we're working on issues or one-on-ones or you know, as we're focused on the next event or you know, a program that we're trying to implement and what do we do next with that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a hectic, crazy schedule. It usually starts around 7 in the morning, ends about 6 at night, and uh, I'm usually in my car a lot of it. <laughs> so it's, it's busy. On the phone. On the phone. Yeah, absolutely. It's busy. Yeah. So let's, let's uh, uh, dial this back a little bit. You grew up in California. I did. Southern and California. Southern California. Let's just be clear. Yeah. Anybody from Northern California, you're still friends. Um, your dad was uh, where your father was based uh, when he served in the Navy. He did, yeah, 30 years. Um, talk about the work ethic that your dad taught, taught you. Yeah, I mean, I think it really starts with, you know, first it's about integrity and honesty. Um, you know, he, he was the kind of guy, he was, you know, he was an, an enlisted guy for, the half, for half his career, so this is kind of the lower ranks in the military, and he uh, received a commission after he had, served for 15 years and became an officer and that was an opportunity really for him to lead larger groups of people and uh, he was really well respected. We had gatherings at our house all the time with people that served with him and it was always you know fun. I was, I was just a little kid so they had no reason to you know be nice to me or even talk to me but it was really um, it was really nice to hear them always speak so fondly of my dad as a leader and uh, a mentor and a friend and uh, he was, you know, he left the house at 4.30 in the morning uh, almost every day and drove to downtown San Diego and he'd get home normally between 5 and 5.30, um, but he, uh, he, he would come home and he would cook, right? He'd cook dinner for our family and, um, you know, he was just a, he's just a solid human being. 
he taught me the value of a couple things. Number one, that I think I've carried with me, I hope I have. Um, people are people. And uh, they're not, you know, they're, they're human beings that are working for you, with you, um, but they also have lives and families. And he felt it was really important that he would get to know those people for who they were, not just for who they were, you know, in the Navy. Mm. And uh, so he, you know, that and, of course, you know, the military kind of ingrains discipline in you, uh, the discipline to have focus and drive and, um, you know, hard work. And he definitely instilled that in me. I'm a very driven human being, um, sometimes to my wife's chagrin. So. Um, did you work when you were little? I did. I got my first job when I was 15, my first paid job, W-2 type job, uh, when I was 15. And I, uh, it was probably one of the hardest jobs, actually, I ever did. Um, I, I worked uh, in, a, in a, a nursing home. And I, was a, I, I served food to them. It was like a, like a waiter, kind of. And, um, and it was minimum wage. But I could tell you something that, you, you know, you, you learn everything. You learn something from every job you do. And um, it was really, really, really fascinating to sit with these folks that uh, this was in the, you know, 1990s. They were in the twilight of their life. And they, many of them have grown up, had grown up during the Great Depression. Mm. And um, I could tell you just a really quick story. I know this probably wasn't part of what you wanted to know, but we would find... Uh, <laughs> We, we lost a lot of silverware. And uh, every, every once a week, we'd have to go to their rooms, and they would collect the silverware. And, uh, you know, one of the managers of the facility said, well, this is a, you know, a, a product of their time in the Great Depression when things were so scarce uh, that, you know, you would, you would have something like that, and you really had to hold on to it. It was valuable. So, uh, but it was, yeah, talk about hard work. It was messy. It was dirty. Um, it was, but it was a ton of fun, too. That's great. So um, John has attended three of our esteemed higher education institutions in the state. So UVU, the U, and Utah State. Yeah. Um, and BYU and, for a summer. Oh, we weren't going to mention that. But <laughs> sorry. Three of our esteemed public institutions. Oh, right, right, yeah. We don't talk about, we don't talk about the other blue schools. That's exactly right, right? right? We don't talk about the other blue schools. My bad. Schools. We'll edit that out. That's right. You get one. <laughs> so as you went through um, that experience, especially your undergrad experience, did you have an idea of what you wanted to do for a career? I don't think, I still don't think I do have an idea of what I want to do for a career. Uh, no, I didn't. I, um, uh, you know, I, th I think I always knew at some point that I wanted to be involved in politics. Uh, I absolutely never wanted to run for office. But uh, my, my favorite subjects in high school were history, the social sciences. Um, I was fascinated by politics at the time. Being an only child you know, and having a dad that was very patriotic, very concerned about the country, uh, very much a part of the Reagan revolution, uh, watching that growing up um, you know, kind of got me connected to it. Um, and so I think I always knew I wanted to be in politics, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just knew I never wanted to be in elected office. Yeah. You can see how life changes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you graduate uh, with an MBA from Utah State. Go Aggies. Go Aggies. Thanks, thanks to the great Kathy McConkie here on Third thanks Row. Thanks to the great Kathy McConkie, that's right. Um, you worked at several technology firms. Uh -huh. So tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about that journey. Well, um, I actually got into technology by accident. I was in the call center space, and I did not love it because uh, it was it was just it wasn't career oriented it was it felt more like a job and so a friend of mine said hey you've got to come work for this company and be a sales engineer you're really technical you can do it come come be an engineer at this company and I said what's a sales engineer and they said well it's kind of that you know between being really like nerdy and you know with a propeller head and then being a salesperson it's like in between and I was like okay I guess I could do that and so I ended up working for a company called UCN, which at the time was a long distance company. But inside that company, there were these 30 employees that were working on developing this product that was a call center product that they were trying to take and put it into the cloud. And this was you know, 2006. And the only cloud-based companies we even had any inkling of was a little tiny search engine company called Google. And so we were like, OK, we can try this. And you know, starting from there, I ended up in, in sales roles rest, basically the rest of my career. And um, 
And it was really fun. That, that company, by the way, while I was there, rebranded to be called In Contact, which is one of the largest mm -hmm. tech companies in Utah today. It was purchased a couple years ago from an Israeli company called Nice for almost a billion dollars. Um, fun to see those, you know, almost like your kids, right? They've grown up and mm -hmm. they become successful, and uh, it's, it's fun to see that happen. I left there to run, um, to run a, a sales for the Americas for AppTask, which is a project management software that later rebranded while I was there to Workfront. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to lead almost the entire sales effort at Workfront uh, for six, nine months before I left. And then, uh, and then I left there to, uh, to take on a, a, a really uh, kind of a strategic role in a company called uh, Steeton which rebranded itself six months later to Rise Point, a uh, St. George-based company that relocated to Salt Lake City. And uh, I ran all of sales and services um, uh, for that and worldwide partnerships for that organization for a couple years. What, you know, what a fun journey to help build something and really create. Um, I believe that's innate in us as human beings, the ability to create, the need to create, actually. Um, so anyway, it's a fun journey there. And then a year ago, kind of come to this interesting opportunity here at, at UTC to, to lead the organization of seven and um, you know right right in this like intersection of business and politics that uh, is so important and critical even in a state like Utah yeah so my earliest memories of Utah's technology space is word perfect and mm -hmm. Nobel right everything comes from there so um, 6500 roughly companies that are members of UTC um, what is your greatest challenge as a, as a CEO of an of a organization that supports them? How do you do that? Well, it's not easy because they're varied in scope. Yeah. Some are life sciences companies, some are software companies, some are hardware companies, consumer product companies. All of them are you know, tech. We've got service providers, people that, um, that provide to the technology community and uh, an academic uh, you know, members as well that all are trying desperately to serve Mm -hmm. the workforce needs uh, of our state. Um, so the biggest, I think the biggest challenges that, uh, that all of the community builders build, uh, have is uh, balance, is trying to find consensus on issues that we can all agree on that are driving you know, whatever this economy looks like, uh, which is one of the reasons why we've discovered that there are really three things that align all technology businesses in the state, um, education, uh, being number one, how do we fill that? How do we make sure that the pipeline keeps getting filled with, with people that uh, are going to be able to work? And 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 you know, I, I mentioned this yesterday. We had a, a meeting with DWS, and I said, um, technology companies don't just need software developers. Uh, recently, a, a CEO said to me, "I can't hire a staff accountant to save my life." Hmm. Um, so we have needs everywhere: program and project management, accounting, uh, software development, uh, UX design, leadership roles. Um, you know, market, people that understand marketing from a psychology perspective, from a demand generation perspective, uh, these are massive needs. So, so serving that talent pipeline is, is, is number one. Number two, edu or, sorry, education is, is number one, so, fill, filling that talent pipeline. And then how do we develop the talent we already have? How do we keep growing and finding best practices and helping people learn? And that's one of the roles of a trade association, to bring thought leaders together uh, in, in a role-based um, discussions so that they can, you know, grow and learn, and then quality of life is a you know an important component of that because when you ask people why do you want to re we get businesses that relocate here all the time, and when you ask them why do you relocate here, what is it about Utah that you love and that helps you want to to grow a business here, they will tell you consistently it's quality of life, mm -hmm. uh, easy access to recreation, the the diversity of our landscape from the Red Rocks of St. George to the beautiful mountains and one of my favorite places in the state in Bear Lake up here. And so, uh, and everything in between. And so how do we preserve that? Uh, everything from air quality to our recreational opportunities and transportation infrastructure and keeping, uh, you know, keeping our economy moving. So those are the three areas where we found, hey, people really do kind of coalesce around that. So we keep focused. And and circling all of that is this business environment that we have in Utah that helps keep businesses wanting and able to thrive. Um, let's talk about balance a little bit on a personal level. So you're a state legislator, mm -hmm. member of the leadership team. Um, first, just so for, for Levi's edification, 
What does the assistant majority whip do? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. There are, four, there are four members of our House leadership team. Everyone knows, uh, you know, the top one, the Speaker of the House. Uh, who actually is the speaker of the whole house, not just you know the Republican Party, even though that's the party that he uh, typically is from. Uh, we also have a majority leader who leads the majority caucus, and his uh, his job is to make sure we keep on track and we have an agenda, and you know we we lead our caucus and we have you know robust discussions about all the policy things that we're working on. But then uh, our good whip, uh, currently Representative Gibson from Mapleton. And the, the assistant whip myself, uh, our job is to quite literally whip the votes uh, to, to make sure that if it's an issue that's critical for the caucus, uh, for the legislature, for the state, that we have the votes necessary to pass it. And so that's our primary job. The assistant whip also happens to take a sort of undefined role as floor leader in the House. So, uh, you know, I've, I, uh, had, I've had a lot of fun over the last couple of years kind of leading our, our efforts to, to move legislation quickly, especially the last couple of weeks. Yeah. So responsibility for your constituents, uh, responsibility for a leadership team. You're also a CEO. You have a family. How do you put all that together? I don't. But uh, That's not the answer I'm, I want you to tell these people. I'm grateful. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Scratch that in the edit. Uh, I, I have an incredible wife. Um, and I know some of the folks here in the audience know her uh, because you kind of grew up in our neighborhood, but uh, she, she really is the leader in our house. She makes sure that the family side of things uh, operates really, really smoothly. She's, you know, she's the COO of our house. Um, in addition to that, I, I, couldn't, I could not be in the legislature without the support of my family. Um, you know, my youngest daughter, who's, you know, five, she'll be six next month, she, um, she doesn't even remember a time when I wasn't there. She was born a month before my first election. And, um, and we've tried to include them in that process uh, of the legislature. They, they come up to the, to the session, in the, up to the Capitol a few times a year. Every kid tends to spend a half a day or a day with dad. Um, and, you know, so they, they get to participate as well. And, and uh, they may or may not have actually pressed the voting button. But uh, uh, so, I mean, you know, there's a whole, there, you know, that's, that's an important part of it. Luckily, uh, one of the things that makes Utah so great is that our legislature isn't like Congress. We aren't in session 365 days a year. And so from a balance perspective, we, we have to live with what we do up there. So we have to go back to our real lives. We have to go back to the business world. And so, um, you know, making sure that UTC and our tech community stays consistent and managed for six weeks while we're in general session is certainly a challenge. But outside that, managing the legislature and the business world um, is a very natural thing uh, for most people at this point. Um, it, it is definitely busy, but, uh, but we figure it out. Yeah. So the session uh, is 45 days, mm -hmm. late January to March, early March. Um, Let's talk about your team at UTC. I'm sure they play a big role while you're gone. Couldn't do it without them. Um, what do you look for when building a team? Wow. Well, um, I've been building a lot of teams uh, for a long time. And I think there's a few things that always stand out. Number one, uh, you need people that can execute. Uh, that's probably the, the first you know, thing. Can they, can they grab the vision? Can they encapsulate what it is and embrace what it is we're trying to do? Can they understand the part that they need to play in that, and can they execute it? Um, that's number one. That's most important. Number two, uh, they have to be able to work together. One of the things that doesn't work in a business is when you have silos. And I can remember uh, one of my first times approaching one of the three companies that I mentioned earlier. Um, there was a lot of angst between sales and marketing, which if anybody who's going into marketing in here, you need to hear this. It's really important. Sales and marketing always have a natural tension. Always. Uh, sales feels like marketing's not doing enough to give them enough leads and enough business. And, say, and you know, marketing feels like salespeople can't close to save their life. And they're just dumb salespeople. And you know, there's truth to both of those things. But uh, sales and marketing must be 100% aligned. And they must be best friends in the business. Um, and they have to be. Because if they aren't, then nobody wins. 
And so I remember uh, going into that first meeting with my head of marketing, which was two hours after I started. And I said, you and I are going to be best friends. And I know you haven't liked the previous sales leaders, and maybe you won't like me. And that's okay if you don't like me, but we are going to be best friends here, and we're going to figure out how to make it work. That ability to collaborate and uh, build bridges and come together in a team is so important because if you can't do it, then you're fractured and you're, you're going off in different directions and not communicating and you're inefficient at the same time. So, so looking for somebody who has a, a willingness and ability to work and operate in a team, um, you know, find common ground and build bridges together, uh, that is, you know, it's also a tough thing to find. Yeah. It's a really tough skill to, to highlight or identify in a job interview. But those are the two things I'm looking for. Aside from demonstrated historical competence in the role that we're trying to hire them for. So, so um, what do you look for in an interview? You have yeah. half an hour, you have an hour, yeah. and you're trying to find out a lot. I'm gonna ask a lot of example questions. I wanna force them to talk, but I can tell you this. Um, you, it's, it's unnerving being somebody who's being interviewed right? Somebody who's the candidate for a job. And I've always found that it makes more sense for the person who is interviewing to start the conversation. So relax that person. Give, give them an overview of you, of the company, of the mission, of the role, of what you're trying to accomplish. And then let the conversation be natural. And as you're having a conversation with them, start to interject things like, tell me about a time when you had to do X. Tell me about an experience you had, either professionally or personally, where why happened and how did you handle it? Uh, looking for someone to give you feedback and guidance and advice uh, on a specific topic is so important because that is really more demonstration rather than just, oh, I know I'm supposed to say I'm honest. I know I'm supposed to say I don't have any weaknesses or, or maybe my biggest weakness is I'm a perfectionist. You know, I mean, we've heard it all. So getting, getting past all of the rote answers and into real experience is important. Yeah, that's great. Um, what is important for our students to understand about the interplay of business and politics? Yeah, so um, I guess the first thing I'm going to say about this is it is important. And um, the most important thing you can do right now at this stage in your life is to understand who it is that's representing you and understand what your internal motivation and belief system is. Because those two things have to align as close as they can, and if they don't, then participate in a way that allows you to find people that align with you. Um, I mean, I could, I could make it something as simple and as easy as get out and vote, but that's not what I mean. Uh, you know, I think what I mean is figure out what you believe, figure out if the people that represent you believe similar to you, and then make sure they keep either come back to office or if they're not the right person, then find someone who does. Because everything that happens in the political world impacts your life. Uh, even the little things may impact your life down the road. I can't tell you how many times in the legislature we changed things that happened 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, two years ago, because we figured that we didn't do it right or we made a mistake. So there is a massive interplay between politics and business. And one of the ways you see it in Utah more than anywhere else is because when we had an economic downturn 10 years ago, Utah came out of it fast, faster than any state in the nation. And one of the reasons is because we think long term. We play a longer game than uh, a lot of states. A lot of states are reactive to the moment. Um, and we have always planned for bad, bad times. We balance our budget. Uh, we try to keep a low regulatory environment so that businesses aren't encumbered by uh, structures that prevent them from being innovative. So there is, a lot of, uh, there is a lot of connection between business and politics. In Utah, um, a lot of the folks that represent the various districts in the House and the Senate are business people. And so I think that's uh, you know, also interesting here in Utah that maybe isn't the same in every state. We don't have a full-time legislature. We are a part-time legislature, which means everybody who's up there has a, uh, a job, a real job that actually pays real money um, that, uh, that they have to go back to. Yeah, that's great. Well, let's, uh, let's open it up for uh, questions from the audience. We've got some mics up, uh, up front. Raise your hand. 
Tell us who you are and what you're studying. Okay, everybody jump at once. Hi, my name is Grace McGuire. Um, we were all kind of wondering what the uh, what the connection is between UTC and Silicon Slopes. Hi, Grace. Hi. Thanks. What are you studying? Oh, I'm an MBA student. MBA student. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Also, I'm interested in politics. <laughs> uh, yeah, UTC and Silicon Slopes are partner organizations. Uh, Silicon Slopes is a phenomenal uh, organization. That's a branding organization in our state. Branding this uh, this technology community as the as Silicon Slopes, you know, is kind of a juxtaposition to Silicon Valley. Uh, UTC, we really consider ourselves more of the more of the worker bees, the doers, the people that get down into the guts of issues. Uh, we're the only ones that can advocate on behalf of uh, of tech in the state, uh, based on our IRS designation. So, uh, we're absolutely partners. In addition to the Women Tech Council, uh, which is a, another uh, community building organization in Utah. And Bio Utah, which tackles our life sciences uh, organization. So, great question. Hi, my name is Thomas Lundberg, studying finance. Uh, so, I have a question for you. You mentioned that uh, during the economic downturn, Utah was one of the first states to come out of it quickly. Um, what were the steps that uh, you made, like as UTC? What did what were the uh, policies or the things that um, were put into place so that we came out so quickly? I can't speak for UTC. I wasn't here then. But uh, in terms of the state of Utah, um, we have a, a pretty robust rainy day fund that's uh, like a savings account for the state that accounts for a, a, a substantial portion of our budget. So uh, number one, we balance our budget every year which means we don't spend more than we bring in in terms of revenue, uh, which I know is a novel idea for a political institution, but uh, Utah is not the only state in the union that does that. We have ac actually have a constitutional commitment to balancing our budget. So that's the first thing. And uh, our, our fiscal analyst's office is extremely conservative. They're looking out 18 to 24 months, looking at economic indicators, uh, trying to determine whether or not, you know, as they give us projections on revenue, because we're projecting revenue a year out. Uh, and being able to do that with some level of certainty takes a whole lot of outward looking, right? They're looking at economic indicators, you know, 18, 24 months, trying to determine if they can give us authentic, genuine revenue. And uh, they, they definitely warned the state uh, early on that this was coming. They saw it, and uh, we were able to prepare by pulling back some, you know, some uh, expenses that. We, we, could, we knew we couldn't afford. And then when it hit, we were able to supplement the most necessary and needed things in the state with our rainy day funds. And uh, that's, I mean, I can't overemphasize how important that is. Uh, and we, we do that every year. So if there's any surplus at the end of the year, even if it's $10 million, uh, it's a statutory requirement that half of that go into rainy day funds. So over the course of 10 years, we've now built those rainy day funds back up because they got dwindled for two to three years. We've now built them back up, and we're on good, solid, stable financial footing, again, for another you know, inevitable recession. Somebody who studies finance, and there's probably people in here that study economics, you know that everything that goes up has got to come down. And even if it's a small contraction, there will need to be contraction in the market. So my name is Andrew Withers. I'm studying economics and law and constitutional studies. Um, so I was, I'm a college student hoping to get involved politically event, at some point. So I'm just wondering, like, what would you suggest that we can do as college students to start preparing for that um, process? Great, uh, great question. Well, most colleges have, you know, young fill in the blank, young Democrats, young Republicans, uh, whatever it might be, get involved in your college Republicans, college Democrats, whatever, whatever organization, whatever, as I, as I said before, like as you kind of get used to knowing what you believe and how you believe, you'll affiliate yourself in some way with a group of people that you, know, you want to be affiliated to. So participate in those college level you know, groups because they will give you opportunities to go campaign, 
candidates, opportunities to volunteer, to f see how, what it's like to fundraise. And, uh, and then at some point, as you finish your college career here or get into business or later in life, you might say, you know what, I want to I I do something about it. I want to run for office. I want to, you know, whatever it is. Um, but you'll have that underpinning, that experience to say, okay, I know what it's like. I know how hard it is to run for office and how people will beat you up and call you names and you know, you'll write something wrong on your website and somebody will find it and tell you, you know, what you did wrong and people will write satire pieces about you that, you know, make you look like somebody you're definitely not and you'll be able to have the thick skin to handle that because you'll know what rejection looks like. Um, so I think, you know, for me, it's, it's get involved early and not be interested necessarily in running for office, but in learning the process, in, you know, in learning the experience, become an intern. Uh, you know, we, get, we have interns at the legislature for seven weeks, and we have incredible Utah State interns that come down. In fact, my intern this past um, session was from Utah State. I don't know if Maddie's here, but she was awesome. Uh, so, yeah, be, be an intern. That's a great way to get involved at our state level as well. Go to your city council meeting. You'll be the only person there besides the city council members. <laughs> so go, go there and participate and see what, what it feels like to have to figure out how to balance a budget with snow blowing and firefighters and, you know, what are you going to do about the park on XYZ corner? So, you know, get involved in that way. Let me ask a compendium to that. There's a lot of students in here who want to fashion careers in technology. Mm. Um, last week in this space, we had over 50 employers from from around the country, actually, and from finance firms to, to uh, product marketing uh, firms like General Mills, in the end, if you talk to them, they all say invariably, well, we're a technology company. So, you know, what, what do students uh, graduating in, in a few months or in a few years, what can they do to, to get in on the boom? That's, uh, that's going on in Utah, and it's largely, largely driven by technology. Yeah, we're almost 10%. I think the, the pure innovation workforce is 10%, uh, roughly 1 in 10 of, of the workers in Utah. If you figure we have 3.1 million people, about 1.3 or so million workers, we're right in that, that range of 135,000, if, if, uh, if you heard that earlier. Um, again, I would say technology companies need all job roles. If you're in HR, uh, you're needed in a technology company. If you're in finance and you're, you know, want to be an accountant, you're needed in a technology company. If you're uh, a software developer, you're needed in a technology company. Business people, you might go into sales or marketing. Uh, you're desperately needed in a technology company. Um, find a company that represents your values. Um, I think that's the first thing I would start with. It doesn't necessarily have to be a tech company. It could be, you know, hey, you really love Intermountain Healthcare. Well, guess what? Intermountain Healthcare has a ton of tech in it. Um, you know, uh, Parsons Bailey, the law firm, if you want to be a lawyer, they have a, a division within their organization called Parsons Bailey Labs, where, the, where they are developing solutions that are technology-driven solutions to help companies, small companies, uh, protect themselves and manage risk uh, from privacy and other things. Uh, it is all over the place. Uh, if you want to be part of technology, then you, you're going to look for companies that match your values and take your job role with you into those companies. Uh, I, I think, you know, job fairs are one thing, job boards are another thing. I still believe that most people get jobs by introducing themselves, visiting those companies, becoming an intern there if you can, working for free if that's what it takes because you're so committed to that particular company you want to be there, and work hard. Show, you know, show, show your worth and, you know, you've got great opportunities. Thanks. I'm Levi, again. Um, two things. First off, you should let Dean Patel know who's looking for a staff accountant, because I imagine there's a lot of students in here that would love a job come May. <laughs> Second off, um, so there's been a lot of talk about how Utah in general is growing within the tech community. There's kind of this, there's Silicon Valley and then there's this, you know, Silicon Slopes. But my question is, is your focus in growing the startups and the companies that are already here to become big companies? Or are you more focused on drawing in bigger companies to our area and kind of expanding in that sense? So my focus is creating the strongest, most inclusive, and most connected innovation community in the country. 
I don't, I don't travel outside the state much, and I don't, I don't frequently talk to people that are looking to move here. We have organizations in the state, Levi, that are doing that very successfully. Uh, my focus, for the most part, is building the talent we have here, helping companies that are, that are, that are here to grow here. Um, you know, years ago, you heard Dave, do or Dean Patel, sorry. Dean Patel. Oh, <laughs> you, heard Dave, you heard Dave talk about, uh, you know, we're perfect in Novell. And for a long time, they were the only game in town. And uh, then we had this little company called mycomputer.com that eventually became Omniture and went public and, and they got sold to Adobe, right? And now we have this big Adobe campus here, their second largest HQ. Probably there are probably more employees in Utah than anywhere, any other central location. And we need more of that. We, we saw Pluralsight go public this year. We saw Domo go public this year. There will be probably another company that goes public this year in the tech space. And we're always concerned about, hey, if you're going to go public, that means, that means you probably are going to set up roots here. Um, acquisitions where they sort of, you know, pull that company in and then they don't set roots down here is, is concerning to us. So we always want to encourage people to grow here and stay here. And that means that we have to keep our eye on the ball, the long-term ball. Um, you already know that even though we don't have a ton of people, they're condensed in a small space. And we're a large state, you know, 10th largest state in the, st in the, in the country, yet we have the, probably the most dense population. And that's creating kind of problems, right? Uh, housing costs are rising, wages are rising, uh, transportation is getting more difficult. And so one of our jobs is to make sure that we try to keep Utah the kind of place where people want to come. And so I think it, I, I value your question because I don't spend a lot of my time trying to convince companies that are out of state to move here. Certainly some of that time is here. I mean, when I'm asked, I definitely go represent the state and represent tech. Um, but the majority of our time here, UTC's time, is spent you know, engaging with companies that are here, helping them grow, helping them find access to capital so they can grow, helping them find the right talent, um, and you know, having them think about economies outside Salt Lake and Utah County. Um, that's one of the reasons why we, I mentioned we gave that presentation yesterday. All the bright spots in Utah are actually not in Salt Lake and Utah County. The fastest growing tech economies in Utah are growing outside our traditional Silicon Slopes counties. And that's organic. We're not forcing that to happen. That's just happening, which is a fantastic thing for Utah. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm a senior in the MIS program. Um, how do you, as the CEO of a large technology company, uh, balance or manage conflicts of interest um, with your role in the legislature? That's a great question. So um, our, when I first met with our board, um, this question came up from them. It was my very first day on the job. Uh, there was a subset of the board that was the hiring committee and we had gone through this at length with them. And I mentioned to them that when, when I'm at the legislature, I'm Representative Notwell, the representative from District 52 in the Utah House of Representatives. I don't represent the technology industry up there. I bring my experience in technology to bear. Um, I'm one of the few voices uh, in our legislature that has a very deep set of understanding of the tech community and our, and our issues. Um, but my votes and my, you know, my record is about my constituents. And they're the ones who elected me to be in the legislature. And uh, I've only been the CEO for a year and that means I've only gone through one general session in the legislature. Uh, UTC took a formal position on 12 different issues, and I think I voted in favor of those issues 10 times. So I was in alignment with the issues 10 out of 12 times. Uh, I, I can't remember specifically all the, the two that I didn't support or, or supported when I shouldn't have supported, but um, uh, because I, I just don't look at it that way. I've never been somebody who really looked at vote trackers or any of that anyway. I've, I've just voted my conscience and kind of where, where my, uh, my constituents want me to be. Um, so from, a, from managing that conflict at the legislature, I just, I'm very clear about what I'm doing and who I represent when I'm there. Um, and actually that does present some problems. I'm a, you know, I'm a conservative Republican and some of the issues that are important to tech are not conservative Republican issues. And uh, so outside the legislature, as a CEO and an advocate for tech, I advocate for those things, the things that tech cares about. 
And uh, it's a tough thing to do to separate those two roles. Um, I try my hardest. I'm not perfect at it, but I, but I certainly uh, am conscious of it uh, on a constant basis. Hi, my name is Angel Castillo. I am a marketing consultant. I am not a student. I'm taking advantage of great public services from the university. And I wanted to ask you about transportation infrastructure. As we are growing as a state, and in 2050, it's what projected 8 million, 9 million. And um, I'm excited about the growth of Utah, but I'm also wondering how we're going to move those people to those jobs. and and. Does that play into the UTC strategy at all? Uh, thanks, Angel. Absolutely. Um, you know, that goes in that quality of life bucket where we're talking about how we move people from place to place. And, um, and transportation is so much more than roads. Uh, we have rail transportation. We have multimodal transportation in terms of trails and pedestrian uh, walkways. Infrastructure also, you know, tends to, everybody tends to focus on, you know, roads. Uh, you know, in an in innovation economy, we also think about things like rural broadband, rural broadband, because the information and digital roads that connect people from place to place are just as important as the physical ones. Um, in addition to that, infrastructure is also about water. I mean, we, we never talk about water in this state, and I think it's a train wreck that we don't. Um, we, we're okay right now, but with 8 million people, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be thinking about other things. Like uh, how much how much grass can we water? You know, we've got lush lawns in this state, and can we can we maintain that long term? So um, this is one of those areas where you know my experience in the legislature and where we're looking at things from UTC and the growth uh, when we're looking at innovation, where they come where they really come to bear, um, and and I think we are very aggressive in Utah about transportation infrastructure. Um, we're not afraid to bond, and you know, going back to our being prepared for rainy days in 2008, uh, our debt load is one of the lowest in the nation. Uh, so we're, we're always very, very scared about bonding here. Uh, but when we do it, uh, we put those bond funds right where they are going to drive the largest economic and communal benefit. Um, you, I, I don't know if you, I think, I think you might live actually in Utah County or, or you live in Ogden. Uh, there's a huge construction project going on in Lehigh that is almost driven entirely by the growth in this innovation economy. And so we're, um, you know, we're really focused on all of those things. And again, I just challenge and encourage all of you to think about infrastructure, not just about roads or, or rail, um, but it's multimodal, it's, it's digital infrastructure, uh, all of those things. Utah has the most, uh, most fiber connected uh, uh, driveways or dr roadways in the country. Um, how, how good for us to be able to have thought far enough in advance that when we're building new roads, we're putting fiber in the ground. And that fiber then extends all the way to our rural counties. In Carbon County and, uh, and well, Washington County, was, Washington County was rural then, but not as much anymore. Uh, so we've, we've been able to plan ahead so that we are prepared for, for this growth. Hi, my name's Anna. Um, I'm studying marketing and MIS. Um, and I am wondering, you mentioned that Utah plays the long game, um, that we're good at planning ahead, we're good at balancing our budgets and being prepared for those rainy days. Um, and I'm wondering how the rest of us can also play that long game. Um, what your suggestions are to um, make sure that we're always marketable. Um, we know that tech is booming right now. We each know what we're studying for the next four or fewer years. Um, and and how do we be prepared for the years after that? Never stop learning, Anna. That's the first thing I would tell you. Um, in 2013, I said, you know, I'm going to go get an MBA. And my boss at the time uh, said, why do you need an MBA? You've got incredible work experience, you know, behind you, and you don't, you won't need it. I think, you know, if you were 20 years old, uh, maybe you would need an MBA because you know, as time goes on, the MBA is the, is the new bachelor's. Now, this is his opinion. Uh, and I said, well, look, I never, first of all, I never want to be in a scenario where I'm up for a job and the person who's up for a job next to me is nearly identical in skill set but has an MBA. 
and I never want those three letters to stop me. But more than that, uh, as I continue to advance in my business career, um, I know there are a lot of things I don't know. I spent most of my time in sales. Uh, I certainly understand sales and marketing and revenue, but I don't understand accounting. I don't really understand the legal side of things. Uh, I don't necessarily have a good understanding of organizational behavior and psychology. Uh, I, you know, so I could really use some exposure to those things because the higher you go in your career, the more broad your responsibilities are, the less you're an expert in any one thing and you know enough to be dangerous probably heard those phrases before. And I said, I need that broad brush. I need to understand the, the broad landscape. And, um, and I'm really glad I did it. And I'm really glad I did it here in, in a Huntsman MBA because the people that were my professors and instructors and the people that were in the cohort of people that um, I went through school with brought such diversity to the conversation that I wouldn't have gotten that any other way. There's no way I would have gotten that without it. Um, I believe strongly in professional networking. Um, I've believed that for a long time, that you need to take the time for yourself to go and meet people and grow your network and grow your experience and, uh, and connect with people that are very different than you because you'll be exposed to things that you wouldn't ordinarily be exposed to. If I spent all my time as a marketer talking to marketing people, I'm going to have groupthink. But if I spend my time as a marketer talking to HR people and finance people and operations people and you know, whatever it might be, guess what? I'm a way better marketer because now I know how they think. And I can market things to them because I know how they think. And it's, not one, it's one thing to read it in a book. It's another thing to actually talk where the rubber meets the road and talk to those people directly. So uh, you know, I'm a strong believer in lifelong learning. Uh, I'm a strong believer in professional networking. And those are things that you can do to keep yourself fresh, uh, up to date, you know, and all the things that are going on and more marketable. I think that's, that's great advice that uh, we could end this session on. So thank you, John. And uh, let's uh, please uh, join me in, uh, in thanking uh, John Notwell for joining us today at Utah State.